Hello everyone. Today we talk about the dress of the English Civil War armies, including chiefly the, the English and the Scottish armies. Uh, we made, uh, if you remember, yeah, a couple of videos about the uh, introduction to the infantry of the English Civil War, if I'm not wrong, and another similar video, always uh, infantry based. And I remember, today we speak both of the cavalry and the infantry, but you know, in this general punctualization and you know we do this for the sake of complexion there are these wargamistic manuals that illustrate uh, what um, mostly for the sake of fact of people who create dioramas and other models to how do I have to paint my my soldiers right and wanted to know the detail the details and all of this and in general we address them mostly for as far as logistics you know supplies are, is concerned like that is why you know one one army began to be more uniform, especially in this time in history, in the mid seventeenth century, to be issued standard, uh, mostly colors. Right, it's not even about clothes at this point, but properly uh, for the sake of um, you know one side strictly the material problem of saying okay troops should be uniformly equipped. Because they should, as a consequence, also, you know, uh, uniformly supplied, right, by a center, a central institution. It's obvious that the uh, the new model army here um, was uh, a path opener in many ways. In fact, the famous uh, British uh, redcoats will fundamentally come from 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 this tradition, right, in part from uh, from Cromwell's uh, armies. Um, but also for tactical reasons, that is to say, troops had to be more easily recognizable also on the field for the, um, let's say, fluidification of 17th century tactics. We have seen that um, Britain during this war, the war between the three kingdoms, actually, probably men, um, in England, Scotland, and, and Ireland, were, you know, somewhat different from what was happening in, in the continent. Right, there was properly um, a greater element of shot over time, uh, over over pikes. Right, this didn't actually start any specific, uh, you know, tactical tradition. Right, it's not that English armies eventually were, you know, doctrinally a ahead, but it's just that in, in that specific context, they. Uh, in part, they objectively anticipated something, and especially at the level of uniforms, as we will see, that, that there is something there to add. But also for specifically political, strategical, and tactical reasons, we all descend from hierarchically in importance. Um, we've seen this in the other videos. T today, Chief, will we, we talk really about how were these troops not equipped, but specifically clothed, um, Except we will talk a bit more about the the buff coats that were used also as armor. Um, and okay, let's simply go. So one anticipation we could see in Britain in this regard, speci specifically in English among English soldiers, was a higher degree of uniformity. Sometimes, right? English troops had been issued with uniform coats actually since Tudor times something had remained there you know this has it's not a big deal because aside from the train bands it wasn't properly um, much of a, another you know there wasn't a permanent army right? the, the new model army eventually was disbanded after also the um, you know in between the, the two revolutions the um, what was didn't have this direct Continuity with the, the British Army as we intend today, but of course it was a you know first model in fact that um, that served for that purpose, and that's properly the the real change, right? Charles the first had uh, who was actually a very good king uh, at many levels um, had reformed the militia uh, and part of the sh the whole deal of the ship money and the, the, the rebellion and so on with the part of the parliament with the parliament began exactly because of this need, most evident need that Britain had and in fact as you know at the end of the war um, it's uh, you know by the time of the Glorious Revolution uh, 
the English people will pay an enormous amount of mo more compared to everything that Charles I had ever asked, right? So it was just about who was in charge at that point, which is a wholly different matter, right? So we can't talk about an army that was specifically uniform. It's just that in the, in the militia, since Tudor times, they, they cared about this, right? England, historically speaking, was a was a country of um, it was a, an orderly country, right? Of old um, uh, administrative development of consolidated monarchical unity. So there was a way to control the territory, the communities. Uh, in a way, they they were effectively well well you know supplied and paid by the local communities. In fact. This naturally at the beginning of the war went, you know, uh, disappeared. Also because banally, you know, after just a few weeks of campaign, which a militia is not even conceived to serve for, your clothes have become rags. And this is true even for centuries in which uniforms were, you know, true uniforms, right? Uh, after months of campaign, you think that a, a soldier has its uniform. It doesn't physically exist anymore, <laughs> right? So, um, there are other ways also to, to recognize each other, but this is not properly the point. Um, the point here is that the county authorities were normally charged with this responsibility of raising troops for the crown, right? Uh, and specifically to, uh, to, to issue them with coat and conduct, which uh, fundamentally means the, the pay and the uniforms, right? that naturally had to be sufficient only as long as the, the journey was, um, or, or conducting, whatever you want to call it, uh, to the rendezvous of the royal army was concerned, right? So obviously, when the English went a, at war, uh, as for any other power of that time, of that, that development, there were other ways to, to supply, there were mercenaries, right, professionals. Uh, and uh, a central administration that, at that point, took in also these militias to make them work wherever they could. And different counties favored different colors, as you understand, probably uh, according to the local availability of clothes. Um, uh, white or blue uniform coats were pretty common in this context. I don't know whether they were associated properly to local sim symbolism heraldry. It's it's possible actually. Coat of arms, um, and the tradition of uniform units was therefore common. Um, at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, to both the parliamentarians and the royalists, but the choice of color, however, depended on the local supply at that point or the colonel's personal choice, right? So everything was less homogeneous than, than, than it seems. Uh, the net result was that units with the same color coats were commonly found on both sides, right? And the only means of distinction was the field sign, in fact, or field ward chosen for the day. So even the problem of the uniform is relative, as you understand, or at least as we will see now, there were other, you know, ways of simpler ways, right, aside from the coat, to recognize each other. We have example of field signs um, in white cloth worn in the hat band or around the arm, right, and also green bows or, or sprigs of rosemary. The field war of battle also was normally pretty similar. Something, sim something simple, right, God and the cause were for God in Parliament, Right, but um, albeit this reduced complications, sometimes this shouts aside, parliaments aside, but you know, for, for God and the cause, right? They were both fighting for God, um, were were identical. So this, uh, we we know actually that there were not just war cries, but pr practically identical field signs sa stating the same motto. Right, um, and in fact, many officers were also captured through wrongly assuming that the soldiers they rode up to were on the same side. They didn't even bother themselves to escape. They they just went in the uh, in the mouth of the of the wolf. And um, as you understand, also, you know, in a, as a, in a civil war, it's normal you're fighting 
most of the times against people who speak your own tongue and uh, are pretty much the, the same background. Um, and when first raised, regiments were uniformed in a wide variety of colors, right? You know that the regiment was the, the most important unit. Uh, in the armies, it's what properly made up the the, the entire thing, and they uh, there was this esprit the the, the corp uh, in it, and in fact the needs of re recognizing recognizing each other for this reason. Uh, the colors of the uniforms could be either red, blue, green, yellow, white, gray, black, purple, right? And um, there is actually a pretty well documented list of these regiments by color of their of their ensigns and and partly of the uniforms we have tone orange for um, uh, speaking of parliamentary armies we have tone orange for the Earl of Essex Charles Essex Thomas Grantham red for Denzil Holtz red leaned yellow Lord Robarts red lined blue Lord Peterborough Red line yellow, Philip Skippon. Red line yellow, two for Anthony Stapley. Red line blue for Harry Barclay. Red line white um, for both John Holmstead and Randall Mindwaring. Red line blue for Lord Halifax. Red also for Thomas Rainsborough. Red line white for Edward Montagu. Red line blue for Sir Thomas Fairfax, purple for Lord Brooke, blue line white Lord Rockford, blue for a lot for Earl of Stamford, Sir Harry Conley, Sir William Constable, Lord Say and Sale, Lord Mandeville, Sir Arthur Hazelridge, George Payne, and blue line white for George Langham, then green line yellow for John Hampton, green Samuel Jones, green-lined red, Earl of Manchester, grey for Sir John Merrick, grey-lined white for Thomas Ballard, grey for uh, Sir John uh, Gell, Simon Rudgley and Richard Brown, too, white for Sir William Brooke. From, from the Royalist side, instead, we have um, red, somewhat actually less... Um, there are no lined uh, colors here displayed. They are all one color. So red, all for king, the, the king's lifeguard, the queen's lifeguard, Prince Rupert's firelocks, Prince Charles, Sir Alan Apsley, and Edward Opton. Blue for Prince Rupert, Ralph Opton, Thomas Lansford, Henry Lansford, Charles Gerard. We have green for the Earl of Northampton. Robert Broughton, Henry Tillier, grey for Thomas Pinchbeck and Sir Henry Bod, white for Sir Ralph Dutton, Sir Stephen Hawkins, uh, the Marquis of Newcastle, and Lord Percy, black for Sir Thomas Blackwell, and yellow for Sir Gilbert Talbot, Sir Matthew Appleyard, and Sir, Sir John Pollitt and Sir Charles Vavasour. So, um, the uh, to some extent, at least, the, there were some regional supplies, stocks of, of clothes that were created, as you understand, even just from this list, as a semblance of uniformity in the armies. Right? The, as we've seen, the Marquis of Newcastle uh, had these white coats that became somewhat famous, and the issue of clothing to, to the King's Oxford army was, quote, some all in red, coats, breeches, and mountiers, and some all in blue in 1643. As we were saying before, the most significant development uh, in, as far as the issue of uniforms, and not only was concerned, was the new model army, where, quote, the men are red coats all. The wall army only are distinguished by several facings of their coats. And this color was also continued throughout the protectorate and was retained uh, the restoration in the new royal army to become the national color as we were saying before. 
So that's a, at least something that survived all, all along. Um, the facings um, were probably the linings of the soldiers' coats, right, which showed where the cuffs were turned back and may have matched the tape strings used to fasten the coats. Um, this is as far as the colors are concerned. We know less about the actual composition material. And what sometimes these clothes already were, because you know at the time uh, these clothes were issued, but sometimes the soldiers actually sewed the, their own clothes. Um, so they were just given the raw fabric of that color, and that was the discriminant, was the, the, the most important thing. Then they could wear it in different ways. Um, and we're less documented about this. It is possible that some county soldiers were distinguished only by ribbons in their hats, right? Uh, that was the fashion of the time, and you know, normally people wore hats pretty much everywhere. Um, and um, so you have less, uh, less clothes just to spend, also because it was literally also a supply uh, money problem, right? Um, and um, and this makes you understand also how normally the ways to to get clothes was uh, was very you know uh, very autonomous out of the military administration and after all that's more or less what you need also considering that you know wearing this ribbon on your hat considering that troops at this point are yes we've just said that English troops were somewhat more scattered than the usual pike and shot tactics um, present at the time but you know they're all fighting you know as all troops in the pre uh, end of the 19th century in, in a thick formation they have to make volume of fire so it, it's really on the field it's the unit that you are in that counts yes there can be situations in which everything gets messed up probably cavalry uh, had more difficulty at recognizing each other than, than infantry um, we get this broader impression that basic aim uh, can be seen, for example, from an order of September 1642 for the clothing of the English soldiers in Ulster, which um, specify a cap, canvas, doublet, cassock, breeches, two pairs of stockings, two pairs of shoes, and two shirts for each soldier. Right. Which actually is a pretty good one, but this is just on paper. And we know, for example, that just in Parliament's new armies, uh, there wasn't such a luxury uh, clothing. However, still, orders, even in this case, were to for the issue of, quote, coats, shoes, shirts, and caps to each soldier in August 1642. And in fact, there is no record of the caps actually having been issued, right? Um, who knows, probably because they, they already had them, I don't know. But, um, it, for example, the soldier's snapsack was, right, because this is the only one we have actually knew of. Um, and the snapsack was a sort of um, pack in which the, the, the trooper carried uh, any spare clothing, food, or plunder, whatever he had acquired. Um, this was even important also just for logistical reasons more than the, the clothing naturally was concerned. Also we have the same issue, uh, the same equipment issued in 1643 um, to Essex's infantry including coats, shoes, shirts and snapsacks. And not until uh, it's re-keeping after the Lost Withiel disaster of 1644 the, the breeches and caps were issued to his army. The term cassocks and coats seem to have been really interchangeable. The equipment of local troops is less certain, like we know of troops that were literally uh, mobilized uh, or drafted, you know, forcely, uh, you know, from the peasantry. So you have to imagine 
Uh, usually the royalist armies are said stereotypically to have had more peasants, right, because also of the lordly connection and all this stuff, but uh, generally speaking, you have to imagine this dramatic heterogeneity of clothing, right, in, uh, in uh, as, as understandable, and as it wasn't strange after all, all over Europe at the time, at least as far as, you know, the, this uh, militias at the end of the day were concerned, and not the professional troops that tended, as we've seen instead, even here, to be more, uh, that those who received at least a regular pay were more um, s standardized, also in appearance. Um, we know even less about the king's army clothing issues, uh, the royalist entrepreneur Thomas Bushell undertook to provide, quote, soldiers, cassocks, breeches, stock kings, and caps for the king's forces in March 1642, and those of his infantry in Oxford in 1643 received matching suits of coats, breeches, and Montero caps. The breeches and caps um, also uh, represented an improvement on the issue to Parliament soldiers who had to wear their own and there is reason to suppose that royalist units were actually uh, no worse clothed than their opponents as sometimes one would think um, and this was however still a low level of, of clothing generally speaking as we have seen during campaign this clothes whatever had been at the beginning became rags basically also officers and non-commissioned officers uh, sometimes wore simply their own civilian clothes very from Boyan uh, as you know from, from the fashion of that time um, with the exception of corporals and less passados if any who wore instead properly the regimental uniform and the drummers who at least wore whatever their colonel or captain chose to. You know, the colonel was at the head of the broader, you know, of, of several regiments, uh, the captain at the, of a single, and, and, and of some, re usually one regiment on his own, it was at the top of the column, so, so for, for the time the col colonel comes from, and the captain, uh, also the rest of the captains, certain regiments. Uh, we have uh, an exception, at least for the officers serving in Ireland, who seem to have been issued more expensive clothing, the cost of which was to be deducted from their pay. Right. Consider also this um, regular reality of, of the time, in the absence of a truly centralized state and military administration, for which um, th there were, you know, regiments were normally commissioned, so the um, you know it was a business the the commissioner tried to, to squeeze his troops best so that they were mostly under um, not only under equipped but probably dramatically under strength we have actually seen this in the video on the English um, civil army infantry and also in other contemporary situations so as far as the cavalry is is concerned we have less way documentation than for the infantry, right? Uh, this occurs mostly, I presume, from because of the social extraction of these people that, generally speaking, could afford kind of more stuff on the road. Um, so they didn't need to be disciplined so much like the infantry. They were also simply way more people. Um, and they also needed somewhat a bit more of uh, collective care. But we have accounts surviving, for example, the one of Sir Thomas Dallison, who obtained 300 to 400 yards of red cloth to make cloaks for Prince Rupert's horse. And of a quartermaster of the Earl of Denbigh's uh, horse, who obtained eight and a half yards of grey cloak. Also, most Civil War officers regarded any cloth that they could obtain uh, as a suitable as suitable to clothe their soldiers right regardless of its color um, as you understand for practical reasons and there is no great evidence of a particular uniformity for cavalry units these were in fact 
as we said now, also sometimes personal retinues of officers um, that, yeah, in that sense could be uniform because they were under the same guy that usually paid for the for a single piece of cloth that was bought, as we've seen in a previous example. Uh, and we know it was common at least before the war, right? Because naturally these people went around uh, on their own, also armed and having this specific uh, kind of paramilitary functions on their own. And you were talking about servants also too, though. So uh, in the military situation, it's um, it, it's it's something different, generally speaking. Not that these people were maybe different people, right? Were maybe literally the same ones, but still, uh, this presents different needs or of equipment uh, um, and provision in general. Also, the new model army, like earlier parliamentary armies issued, as we've seen, its foot soldiers with coats and breeches. And one variant specifies that such coats are only for foot soldiers. So it would seem that they they didn't care much about the cavalry uniform, probably for the same reasons. And during its le later campaigns, the new model issued cloaks to their horsemen, and it may be that these were the standard alternative to coats for horse troopers throughout the war. So this was also a kind of a more evident means of recognition. It's a cloak, right? It, of course, it has a pra an important practical function, but it's also something you can see exteriorly speaking. There is not necessarily what these guys would have not worn otherwise. So Monk assumes that the cavalryman will wear a doublet with hooks and eyes to support his breeches. And some have suggested that buff coats were so universal that uniform clothing was unnecessary for this very reason. So, we, we really don't know. And, however, there is pretty good evidence of a scarf or sash to be um, to have been more important, especially for recognition. John Vernon makes it clear that horsemen, but not common soldiers, wore sashes. He writes, every horseman must wear a scarf uh, of his general's collars and leave it off neither in his quarters nor out of his quarters, it being an ornament unto him. Besides, it will cause him to forbear many unfitting actions as being thereby distinguished from the vulgar common soldier. Um, it, it is likewise as a good and visible mark in, in time of battle to know one another. Uh, I can't render how probably a you know a native speaker knows per how to perfectly pronounce the older English uh, as it's written in here. Later we will try to read uh, you know some some Scottish stuff. It's, it's fascinating. Um, in in the earlier part of the war, the royalists wore red or crimson sashes, as the parliamentarians um, wore instead orange, the color of the Earl of Essex. Now you see that this is very kind of casual, right? It, it, it corresponds to, to reasons that are not so immediate, you know, st needs of standardizations. It's just, you know, okay, well, what color do we issue? Okay, this one, because the guy has it. So, uh, it's that simple. Uh, other colors could be worn by soldiers in regional armies according to the choice of their commanders alike. In September 1642, for example, troopers were given uh, 10 shillings each to buy a scarf, which was a great deal of money at the time, considering that the superior quality of horsemen's sword costed only 8 shillings at the time. And it may be that such was so important also and exactly because cavalrymen did not wear a uniform coat. So the sash had to be worn, you know, uh, outwardly, we could be easily seen, also from the distance, it was out there, the cavalryman is uh, also more exposed. So that was probably enough, right, differently from a, from an infantryman, um, to, to be recognized in that way. Also, there is this other element of the buff coats that um, developed fundamentally from the army doublet which was worn under full body armor. Uh, this was made of leather with sections of ring mail where joints in the armor failed to offer protection and often had straps and ties for securing the separate pieces of armor. Um, and it, it was both a cloth and an armor, as you understand, 
um, it's padded armor for the mage. You know, it prevents the the edges of the metal rubbing and tearing, which is pretty pretty bad. Uh, it isolates, thermically speaking, both from cold and from 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 heat. And there is to consider that the, during the English Civil War's armor kind of sank in uh, availability. So, actually, this type of armor was was uh, forcibly from one side the the one at that point you you may have uh, the only one you might have. But also, it, it was objectively effective. I mean, you know, cutting weapons um, could be effectively stopped sometimes by this. Uh, it, it all depends very much on on the blade on, on lots of aspects actually on, on of, of course in the incidents the degree of it which it hits there isn't much to do uh, for fi for firearms because that has you know a projectile has so many gels that you know at that, that point in fact armor is uh, you know is, is somewhat disappearing um at least compared to previous centuries and tendentially and um, however, as you understand, for cavalry that was more involved directly in hand-to-hand -hand combat, that could be a, an extra protection. And Monk recommends a girdle to buff to be worn below the back and breastplates rather than uh, underneath them. Um, this is this was done too, actually. This was done also with uh, with other formal armor, at least in previous centuries. You know. And um, these are mentioned uh, are specifically to protect the legs from sword cuts rather than a, as an underlining to the arm. And we have contemporary pictures of European soldiers that show mostly sleeveless buff coats cut short, which has, which are worn fundamentally only as under armor padding, right? And that's the, the how the idea was was adapted by having leather lining. F uh, linings fixed into individual pieces of arm, um, and buff coats came into a wide variety of uh, thickness and uh, qualities. John Turbville wrote of buff coats in September 1640 that there was quote not a good one to be gotten uh, under ten pounds, a very poor one for five or six pounds. However, we um, may take it that Turbeville's poor buff coat was much superior to those issued to common soldiers as well. So, for in 1647, Colonel Thorpe paid only 30 shillings each for three buff coats, right? And in 1642, Sir Samuel Luke paid uh, 58 um, um, pounds, 15 shillings, um, for buff coats for his arquebus years. And Luke doesn't tell us, unfortunately, how many buff coats his money had bought, right? The same accounts indicate that he was trying to keep 64 men, right? So it's difficult to speculate what a what a 30 shilling buff coat might have been like in this regard. We don't know the proportion. Uh, for the troopers, buff coats preserved a little coat, for example, are well made of thick leather and fully sleeved, while an example in the National Army Museum is crudely made and lacks sleeves. Uh, also, uh, it's it's important to to stress how the the, the new model army cavalry's man helmet and back breast costed only twenty shillings. Right? So, uh, buying a, a buff coat would make it a, a further expensive addition. So. Uh, Speaking of the Scots armies of the English Civil War, so Spalding writes this quote: Upon Friday, sixteenth of February, Captain Strauchan marched out of Aberdeen with six score ten soldiers, captains, and commanders, furnished it out by the said burke upon their own charges and expenses. Ilk soldiers was furnished with a tuas sarkis, coat, breakis, hoist and bonnet, bandies and shone, an sword, an musket, powder and ball for so money, and other is some 
our sword and any pick according to the order and ilk soldier to have six shillings um, shillings uh, ilk day during the space of 40 days of law and silver ilk 12th of fame had any any baggage horse worth 50 pundis any stop any pan any pot for their meat and drink to get there also <laughs> With hair here or levy or loan money ilk soldier estimate to ten dollars and in furnishing and all to one hundred merkis. Right. So the other marshals men described in this passage were extremely well equipped. And nevertheless the provision of any stand of grey clothes to a sarcus uh, that means sarcus would be shirts, right? And to a pair of shoes this is understandable also is recorded by Spalding in 1640 as typical of the early Scots armies we know a few about this equipment after all and however you know hints uh, evident you know um, hints at a fairly uh, similar equipment to the English counterparts and uh, clothing order for English soldiers serving in Ireland in 1646, for example, was to be made up using two and a half uh, yards of woolen cloth per suit, together with a quantity of canvas for lining in pockets. And uh, this is enough for making a simple pair of knee breeches and the four-tailed coat mentioned in a 1615 petition from Fife. Both for the Scottish armies and the new model, the English new model army, we we have no evidence of buttons, right, mentioned as as an an issue, right, and therefore we believe they were actually made by the soldier themselves, as uh, from twists or of clothes sometimes, uh, as other parts of their their gear, and this was also pretty much universal in Scotland at the time. Scott soldiers also received pieces of lining or linen from time to time. Um, this was presumably in order to make themselves pair of drawers. We know for example that in February and March 1645 some men of Colonel William Stewart's and the Earl of Cassillis regiments received a cash allowance in lieu of that half yard of linings to which they were entitled. And also we know of a cargo of French linings that was consigned to the troops in Aberdeen in October 16, 1646. Um, shirts were also normally made of harden, uh, that is a sort of coarse form of linen. And uh, in 1640, Major General Robert Monroe uh, ordered a quantity of this material for tentage as well and um, however this could vary also just for atmospheric reasons uh, of the weather as you understand and um, in fact it seems that he transformed this into shirts material instead and you, you have to imagine once again the, the, the material misery of what a you know, soldier experience could be in this regard as well. We know of uh, hose or stockings cut from woolen cloth, usually cursy, to judge at least for, from the purchases. And however, since knotted stockings became a staple export from Aberdeen in the 17th century, it would seem that, uh, you know, Scots soldiers would widespreadly use it, especially the ones coming from, from the area. And also the band is mentioned in Spalding's account were not lone collars but garters for the stockings. Uh, we think that at least the low shows worn by the infantry tended to be lighter than the modern standards. We have some example from 1640 of the Master of Forbes regiment made in Aberdeen that were only single sold, right? And um, consider it you know, we're talking about 17th century Scotland. So these were places that up to, you know, the the day before had knees used just even to, to fight, like, you know, 
not necessarily barefooted, but you know, in, in physical conditions for which it's not that you know that the shoe that will make this huge difference, right? I'm talking about a very wild, uh, uh, say, physicality at, at many levels, and we we know also that in um, uh, you know there was, however, an improvement to make this shoes better. At least in 1640, there is a requisition that specifies the shoes sh should be uh, 10 and 11 inch uh, at at least, right? Um, so this was actually similar to English uh, contracts, right? Corresponding to British show sizes 7 and 8 in US 8 and 9 today. Um, and uh, the famous Cots bonnet also... <coughs> Scotch blue caps, as it was frequently referred to in the English sources, was almost invariably knitted and felted. Um, and there is some archaeological evidence for also cheaper ones made for, from scraps of, um, of woven cloth. These bonnets were used by officers and troops or troopers alike. Um, when the officers of Robert Monroe's regiment were made freemen uh, of, of, of Aberdeen. They were reported to have marched out of the town with their burgess tickets stuck in their bonnets. And um, Scotland um, saw, you know, pretty much everywhere this, um, this bonnets worn by by soldiers. We, these were used anywhere. In fact, they're not issued anywhere, the, the exception maybe being the ones of the Earl of Marshall Regiment in 1644, right? But otherwise, it was a pretty common costume. Another typical Scottish item is the plate, right? It was not as large as necessarily as the, the typical one associated to the Highlanders, but uh, could be a modest time. Ancients could be easily, just easily woven in a tweed pattern. Uh, as as tartan, and we have archaeological example from Quintfall Hill in Caithness with a plate measuring uh, eight feet and six inches by five feet, right? And uh, which is pretty much commercial for those time standards. And also the plate served, as you understand, by as a mantle or as a cloak, uh, even uh, this by day at night uh, as a bedding. So. Um, people sleeping outside as well you know an English traveler said that uh, the this cause you know warned us even when they were plugging uh, and so on so it was worn basically at all times so pretty simple video just like that not much more to add and maybe we'll come back on the topic I don't know uh, you know it's one of those things you say one time only and then you move on because I don't think it's an, it's boring, right? But it's obvious that it's more description, it's more analytical, less synthetical as a as a video type. But here we are. So for now, we stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.